On Blast. This is Fall on Blast, part of the On Blast Podcast Network. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you like it, then subscribe and tell your friends. Holla. On Blast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind for tuning in once again to a little thing we like to call the Ball on Blast Podcast. As always, my name is Sean Alexander. I'm joined by my guy, Andrew Webster. Webby, what is good? I have the world was shaken and not by NBA trade news. This time it was football trade news. Right? Odell Beckham Jr., what are the Giants doing? <laughs> let me first not say winning. Let not me, winning. Let me, let me first say that I'm very thankful that my Philadelphia Eagles play in a conference like the NFC East. <laughs> it's every year I thank my lucky stars to have the Giants, the Redskins, and the Cowboys all in the same division. Because you know at least two of those three are going to do something stupid in the offseason. And, <laughs> and the Giants, the the Giants, you know, made that come true. Hey, that that is always a safe bet. I don't know how that trade makes much sense at all, but it's like the NFL took a page out of the NBA's book in terms of just wild, crazy off-season player movement with stars. But hey, that's why we love the NBA, right? Hey, and what a night in the NBA going on now on a Wednesday. Usually we do this Thursday, but we figured, hey, well, Wednesday we got Rockets Warriors. May as well fire that up on the TV and do this uh, Ball on Blast podcast. Totally. And, you know, of course, Thursday night, Lakers in Toronto to take on the Raps. It's going to be a big one. Big one for the Raps on Blast. Going to be a huge game. And, of course, we got the post-game show on Twitter as well. Uh, The Wrap It Up podcast for sure after the Lakers and Raptors game. But what better place to start than just talk about the week that was for the Toronto Raptors in the sense that there's a big fight with your man Serge Ibaka. (laughs) Uh, the Mark Gasol, there's a lot of the Raptors fan base is is kind of throwing a lot of question marks. Yeah, you got to we got to talk about this because uh, I need to know the solution here. Okay, and Kawhi's load management still seems to be bothering a bunch of people. Lots of stuff going on in Raptor Land, but I think the place to start, to me anyways, because the most exciting part to me was the Serge Ibaka fight. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Have people not learned yet that? Serge Ibaka is not one to mess with, unless I guess you're James Johnson. <laughs> Yo, you don't come from where Serge Ibaka came from and not mm-hmm. be legitimately one of the toughest dudes. There's there, there's two guys in the league that I would not mess with. Two, and they don't they they do not neither of them hail from the United States of America. The okay. first is Serge Ibaka. The second is Stephen Adams. Steven Adams, yes. Steven uh, Adams is not one to mess with, that's for sure. Those are two that guys. Is totally true. Those are two guys that I would not want to face in a barroom brawl, man. <laughs> well, Webby, you know, if as you know, as I've tried to, to preach to you, and our listeners will also know that if you are of age and if you enjoy fun things, but knowing that it tiptoes maybe on the borderline of inappropriate from time to time. We love tiptoeing on the borderline of inappropriate. Oh, we live on that board. <laughs> yeah, line. set up shop on but that line. One of those fun Twitter accounts that I tell people to follow is the man Cuffs the Legend, who <laughs> we will remember was the one behind LeBron going to LA. But he tweeted during that brawl, he tweeted, quote, I told y'all several years ago, Ibaka fetched water in crocodile infested <laughs> yeah. waters as a child. He ain't scared of nobody. <laughs> I saw that too. I I didn't realize that was Cuffs the Legend, but I saw that Yo, too. Yeah, you so don't good. go you don't go get water in alligator waters without <laughs> without being very tough. Yo, a baka is not one you don't play with a baka. But I, I liked need, it just because I, I they were getting an, shit kicked in Cleveland. Yeah, and Marquise Chris, like, who are you? As as we learned from Atlanta, you're either getting stunted on or you're the stuntee, right? You're either doing the stunting or you're getting stunted on, right? <laughs> yeah. That was the line. Yeah, <laughs> and your man's Marquise Chris for some reason was feeling himself and decided he was just gonna walk over Serge Ibaka. And Ibaka's like, "No, bro, that's not happening." Oh, and gave him the quick choke out. <laughs> he says something to him. Chris, sure he did. Chris says something to him, and I don't know what it is, but I really want to know what it is <laughs> oh, because definitely. I'm sure it's pretty sweet. Now the other thing if, is too is like 
uh, Serge Ibaka like just missed catching a case. Yeah. If, if he had hit him. Well, Chris almost hit him with the first punch, and then that's really when Serge threw the punch back. But at the same time, it's probably what the second or third time because the punches thrown with him and Brooke Lopez, or no, Robin Lopez. Yeah, Got Robin my Lopez, Lopez twins mixed up. But uh, Robin Lopez, those punches were close to being thrown, and if or no, they were thrown. But if any of them connected, yeah. that would have been a problem. It would have been ugly. It would have been ugly. But, yo, but, Serge throws that thing with the quickness, though. <laughs> yo, I'm here for it just because, A, I'm always for when someone feels disrespected. Sometimes you got to G-check someone. I'm here for it in that instance. And, two, hey, let's be serious. We were talking about Serge Ibaka possibly needing some games off for some load management of his own. Here's just some self-inflicted load management. And, plus, uh, our guy, is it Bobby Marks? He tweeted out that, this move actually saves the Raptors money as well. Really? Serge Ibaka getting suspended. I didn't know that if you get suspended, that money actually comes off of the books for the team. And so it saves the Raps like half a milli off the books for the Raps for Serge Ibaka getting suspended for three games. Yeah, here's a tweet right here. The three-game suspension will cost Serge Ibaka $448. $276 in total salary. Toronto will serve about 560,000 toward will save, sorry. Toronto will save 560,000 towards a luxury tax as a result of the suspension. A brilliant hey. move. <laughs> Maybe Masai told him, "Yo, Masai gave him the call at halftime." You know, I was like, Listen. "If he says something to you, go after him." <laughs> now, I am going to I'm going to say that I did agree with the people out there that, you know, were that were saying that, you know, this isn't like hockey. This isn't where if you're losing by a lot, you send your guy out there to mix it up with the other team, to bring the rah-rah energy to your team. That's that's not what NBA basketball is all about. However, True. however, <laughs> I think that doing this at this time of year, this kind of doldrums of you know, 15, 16 games left to the end of the season, mm -hmm. this is where you do that kind of thing rather than at the beginning of the year or, God forbid, in the playoffs as we saw what happened with Draymond Green. Let your emotions get a hold of you to kind of keep people's focus down the stretch. Listen, I, again, right, and I said on the post-game show too, I don't think that, obviously not condoning violence or anything like that, but one, we know these basketball fights aren't actual fights. That's probably as close to a basketball fight that we're going to see. Right. But – just showing that you are frustrated, you're upset in that situation where you're getting beat that bad against the Cavs, and you didn't like the fact that they're trying to stud on you, I'm okay with a little bit of a pushback. Plus, again, not only Surge getting some rest, cool. I think everybody's okay with that. Yeah. Also, Marc Gasol. Now, Marc well, Gasol... Is, yeah, this is what we got to <laughs> talk about. Marc Gasol is going to get force-fed into some minutes here because, obviously, no Serge Ibaka for three games. That means Marc Gasol is going to be in the starting lineup, and it's been much of the debate in Raptorland in terms of should Marc Gasol be starting or coming off the bench. You got Raptors fans mad at the production so far from Marc Gasol since he's been brought to the Toronto Raptors. And Mr. Andrew Webster, I'm going to ask you, because here's the thing. Since Marc Gasol has come to the Toronto Raptors, this season, he's averaging about half the points that he was averaging when he was on the uh, Grizzlies. Why did I draw a blank there? Half the points about, I think he was averaging about 16 points on the Grizzlies and about eight points since he's come to the Raptors. The numbers aren't there, but I'm asking you, Mr. Andrew Webster, should Raptors fans be concerned with Marc Gasol's play so far? No, I don't think it's got anything to do with his actual play. Like, sure, he's had some off nights, but like, any player his age uh, is going to have, you know, some off nights. I think where the concern has to be is how you're going to be able to get Gasol consistent minutes. Because uh -huh. right now, I'm, you're looking at his game logs, and his minutes are like a roller coaster. Yeah. And if he plays more, he's going to produce more, and he's going to get more comfortable with the offense going through the flow of the game. But if you're only putting him out there for 16 you know, 18, 19 minutes a game, uh, it, it's going to be hard for him to make an impact, especially on the stat sheet, that you're going to be impressed by those numbers. But 
I, I, I agree that, with you. And I think, I, I, at least I hope, that Nurse is going to, like, that's kind of what this period is, figuring out exactly how you can use Gasol best and where you can use him the most. I'm telling you, I think that this will be a blessing in disguise for the Raptors in the sense that he has to start and get major minutes. Because as you said, since he's come to the Raptors, he's only averaging about 23 minutes a game. And Marc Gasol still, even at this point in his career, I think he's still one of the best centers, one of the best big guys in the entire NBA. And what he brings to the table, definitely the Raptors can use in their starting lineup, and especially come playoff time, when everything becomes more of a half-court game and possessions become more valuable, you're going to need more playmaking. He makes the game easier for Kyle Lowry. You'll notice Kyle Lowry's scoring numbers have been up since Marc Gasol's been on the team. The team's assist numbers have been up since Marc Gasol's been with the team. And it just makes too much sense that he should start. Now, the reason why his numbers are down, if you ask me, and the, the thing that I want to calm Raptors fans down about to, is... The fact that what Jonas Valanciunas does in terms of points and rebounds, same thing for Serge Ibaka, just add in blocks for Serge. But those things, when they're playing well, they scream at you in a box score. Right. Mark Gasol, of course he can put up numbers, but JV's never going to get 27 points a night on the Raptors because the Raptors have Kawhi, they have Kyle Lowry, they have Pascal Siakam. JV, at his peak, wasn't going to average those numbers on this team. Marcus Gasol can come in for the Raptors, and if he's putting up 12 and 8, but his assist numbers are somewhere around 4 to 5, which his career average is at, or the, just the, the assists that aren't assists in terms of the hockey assists, the extra pass, the ball movement, all those little things that he also brings to the table on top of being a better defender, that's when Marc Gasol will prove his worth to Raptor fans. I just don't think that they're used to seeing um, – the production from a big guy in which it doesn't scream at you in terms of points and rebounds and blocks. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. And like you said, Gasol's impact goes far beyond uh, 11 and 12, you know, yeah. like a, or, or, a, or, you know, a 13 and 10 night from JV. It, it, it's, it's more than that. And it's being able to play him in, in late game situations the way that you wouldn't necessarily always be able to play guys like Jonas Valanciunas. Totally. His pick and roll defense is a lot better than JV and especially Serge Ibaka as well. I just think he adds different dimensions and he hasn't looked well, that good in a Raptors uniform because as you said, consistent minutes, but also not enough consistent minutes with the starting unit. They've still been playing this back and forth in terms of playing the matchups and so then add in Kawhi's load management. There hasn't been really enough games for him to show and prove and get comfortable. Just little things like getting used to where guys want the ball, getting the guys getting used to where he wants the ball, all those little things. Then I don't I even find that there's points in Raptor games, Webby, where the swing pass will happen and Gasol will do the quick like touch pass, but the guy on the receiving end isn't ready for the pass yet. Like right. he's not ready to shoot it yet. Those things will take time to change. And you know, the Raptors only have, what, about 15 games left in the season? Yeah. Do you think there's enough time still to sort it out? Because I think there is. Yeah, and I don't think that we're talking about sorting it out in the way that, like, sure, they lost to Cleveland, but they're still the second seed in the East. We're not talking about <laughs> exactly. this being a disaster with Marcus Gasol. It's just, <laughs> exactly. sure, he's not putting up 30 and 15, but the Raptors <laughs> are still winning, and he's still having, like, an impact on the game, and that's the important thing. So I don't and think there's anything where, that they need to quote unquote fix with the way that they're playing right now. Yeah, and that's where the funny part always comes in, right? Because sometimes it's always a roller coaster ride, especially when you're dealing with the Toronto media in terms of it's got to be all or nothing, like it's all bad or it's all good when really, hey, they got hyped up for the game Sunday, knowing that that would be the tougher game in Miami. And then they had a letdown Monday night, second night of a back-to-back, -back against uh, a worst. crappy Cleveland team. Yeah, it gets worse. That comes out and plays hard. That's going to happen. As you said, end of the day, you're still second in the Eastern Conference, still second in the entire NBA. Like, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. And in terms of working it out, the part that we're not remembering here, and again, I'm trying to calm down the fan base here because we kind of get worried about things. 
when we say you have time to wor work it out, you're still going to have time to work it out in the first round against the Pistons or the Nets or the or the Orlando Magic. Like, those teams aren't going to beat the Raptors in the first round. Now, am I saying that the Raptors have to go out and sweep them? Of course, that would be a good look. But for all intents and purposes, I cannot see the Raptors losing to the Nets or Pistons or Heat in the first round. So there's still going to be time within the playoffs to work out those kinks in terms of who's your starter and who's coming off the bench and getting that cohesiveness with your core, which are all vets, which is the other reason why I'm not worried, right? Right. Gasol, Lowry, Danny Green, and Kawhi. These are guys who have been there before. Exactly. Exactly. And Pascal's just the hustle, the hustle king, right? Like, nobody's worried about that. Can't be worried about that at all. Um, but in terms of the Raptors, we mentioned that the Raptors are playing against LeBron and the Lakers. And as we speak on Wednesday night, uh, there was word circulating on Blog TO about LeBron throwing a party in Toronto tonight. <laughs> I'm coming to TO one night too late. <laughs> Apparently. You're missing out, Webby. I mean, Thanks, LeBron, for my invite. If you had known before, Webby, right? If he had sent out the invitations before, could have figured it out, could have made it a thing. Well, hey, you know maybe what? we could have been doing the podcast live from well, LeBron's party. Well, listen, I'm like off Facebook now, so I'm sure I got the invite through Facebook and I just missed it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But yes, according to Blog TO, there's a oh, there's a uh, there's a flyer and all with LeBron James, hosted by LeBron James. Uh, the King, LeBron James, makes his return to Toronto, hosting his favorite club, EFS. All right, where's EFS? <laughs> Uh, King Street, just a little bit down the street from where we we used to work at the score. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I thought he was going to music or something crazy. He's keeping it real, keeping <laughs> it down there on King West. Uh, just for people to know, free before 1130 with guest, li guest list and a $500 minimum for table reservation. Just saying. No problem. <laughs> no problem. I'm sure LeBron's got me. But in all, in a more serious note, or maybe not that serious because huh. clearly LeBron's not focused on the playoffs yeah, exactly. anymore. <laughs> but this Lakers season has just gone like up in smoke, for lack of a better term. Eleventh uh, place currently in the West as we speak could be even worse by night's Ooh. end. Six and a half games out of eighth place. Lakers will not make the playoffs. But I'm going to ask you, Webby, who is to blame for the Lakers' demise this season? See, like you, there's so many to pick from. Who gets it's most like, of the blame? It's like a perfect storm of every <laughs> if I, of everybody's best intentions falling flat on their face. Yeah. Now, I'm going to pick two. First okay. one, obviously going to pick LeBron. Oh, LeBron first. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, this is what he wanted. He wanted to go to L.A. He thought mm -hmm. this was going to work his way. It didn't. I know he's trying to do everything he can to turn this team around, but, man. Listen, it's like he, maybe not LeBron directly, but certainly indirectly with uh, Clutch Sports. Uh, I think that's torpedoed the Lakers season. See it how you will in terms of team chemistry or whatever, not getting Anthony Davis. But man, hey, indirectly LeBron is part of Clutch Sports, so I'm going to put the blame on LeBron. Now, the other way I'm going to go is way, way high. Okay? Now, let me ask you, who was running the Lakers? LeBron? No. <laughs> no? No. It's not LeBron? <laughs> no. Like, okay, maybe, sure. <laughs> sure. But, okay, on the masthead, you know, uh, uh, of the L.A. Uh, Lakers. Genie bus. There you go. Oh. Okay. okay. You're the owner of the team. Now, we're. I, I know that we're, we're going to have some tough words to say about the owner of another team who's been prominently involved in L.A.'s uh, uh, swoon here late in the season. Okay. But, man, it starts from the top, right? And if you're Genie Bus, the owner of the team, you've kind of let things fall off the rails. Not just in terms of where the team's going to end up in the standings at the end of the year, but about the way that this team has gone about trying to make itself better throughout the season. Interesting. No, I, I mean, definitely LeBron and Genie Bus. I agree with you. They do deserve some of the blame. But... At the end of the day, when I look at what LeBron James is doing this season, Webby, and he's still putting up 
what, 27, 8, and 8 this <laughs> season? He's LeBron, I, though. He can roll out of bed and take a team of JV high school kids in the NBA, <laughs> and he'd still be averaging. Like, those numbers are so constant for LeBron throughout his career. But that, do we like, understand how ridiculous that sounds, though? 100%. We're going to blame the guy that's going for 27, 8, and 8? No, no, no. Every well, night? You can't blame his play. You just can't do that. He's okay. he's the best basketball player on the planet. He still is. And he's 34 years old or 33 years old or however – I guess he's my age or a year younger. But anyway, he's an old-ass man if he's anything like me. But still to put up those numbers and put up that production, for sure. Like, you can't hold that against him. But it's not just the on-court stuff that you have to bring in with the LeBron. Yeah, there's a lot of things, obviously, in LeBron trying to get Anthony Davis. Just his force of personality. Just his force of personality and the way that, like – just even the nonverbal things that he says that, you know, affect not just the other players on his team, but his coach. Hmm. Yeah. And, Tough spot for Luke. Oh, hundred percent. But again, this is where I'd want more control for my owner. Like you had, I, Jeannie was the one who, before LeBron showed up said, you know, Hey, Luke's my guy. But then yes. when all this has been going on, you haven't heard a word from Jeannie bus. These, these teams, the Lakers and the, and the Pelicans, they were negotiating for Anthony Davis in the press through leaks, <laughs> through sham, through woge. And you know who wasn't putting a stop to that? Supposedly one of the most powerful owners in the NBA. I mean, it all comes from her. You can blame Magic. You can blame Palinka. You can and blame, I will. <laughs> 100%. But doesn't that, doesn't that start at the top of the owner? She's the one who controls those those puppet strings on Palenka, on Magic, she could put an end to all of that talk throughout the uh, throughout the press and that negotiating. She can do it, but she didn't do it. No, I I, I agree with you, Webby, and and for sure you're totally right. Jeannie's bus is the one that hired Magic and Rob Palenka to take care of things and to turn the organization around. But at the end of the day, their job is to put the team together, and I'm gonna blame them just because. I'm not giving them – like, LeBron probably went to the Lakers because Magic was there and he thought that was some form of credibility, so he decided to go there. But part of LeBron going there was trusting that Magic and Rob Polenka would be able to put a team around LeBron that – hey, because you got to remember how this offseason played out. I think people have this – like, people have – there's a bit of revisionist history going on here, right, where people are like, oh, well, LeBron couldn't recruit anyone to go there. It's like, no, no, no. People decided where they were going first. Like, Paul George re-signed with Oklahoma City before LeBron said he was going to the Lakers, right? Like, these things happened. Like, the order that these things happened were completely different than we're remembering them now. So when LeBron went there, he went there knowing that he wasn't going to be going with Paul George. The trade talks had fallen through already between the Lakers and the Spurs, for whatever reason, for Kawhi Leonard. And... He went there with this young cast of characters. And what did Magic and Rob Palenka do? Well, they gave him Rondo. They gave him Lance. They gave him JaVale McGee. They gave him Michael Beasley. But hold on. At the time, time we knew this wasn't going to work, no? But exactly. But they also put into LeBron's head, and LeBron probably put it into their head too, of, hey, you know what we can do if this doesn't work out halfway through the season? You know who my... You know who my agency represents? You know who's a good buddy of mine? Or the other way, hey, LeBron, don't you know Anthony Davis really well? Wouldn't he (laughs) love to come to the Lakers too? But that's why the second person on my list for who's to blame for the Lakers' demise is Gail Benson, the owner of the Pelicans. Because, again, we're going to go I'm going to blame the owner of another team for the Lakers Because we're going to go backwards and we're going (laughs) to – no, follow me for a second. Follow me for a second. We're going to go back and we're always going to look at this and say, oh, LeBron blew up the Lakers season and the young players and the locker room and all that. But if the Pelicans front office wasn't a complete gong show and they would have taken all of those assets, the Lakers would be playing with Anthony Davis right now. And we'd all be saying, man, Clutch Sports really did a good job in forcing Anthony Davis onto the Lakers. Hold on. Didn't she do the right move? Because right now, if they had taken that trade package... They'd have Brandon Ingram, who may not play again. 
Well, hold on. I think that they are not going to get more. Like when the trade does happen in the off season, they're not going to get more than what the Lakers offer was at the very end. That grandfather offer, the big boy offer, the all the chips on the table offer that included Kuzma, Ball, uh, Ingram, Hart, and then a couple of the vets and what two first round picks was it? Like the offer is not going to get better than that. And if you're Boston and if you're the Lakers and if you're whatever other team and you just watch them completely sabotage the rest of their season by saying Anthony Davis isn't playing for them. He's not going to play fourth quarter minutes. They're losing leverage themselves in this situation. They messed this up as well. The Pelicans, they're going to get less than what the Lakers offer was. So we look back on it in hindsight and say, Oh, the Lakers messed up because it didn't work. But if it did work, we'd be saying, Oh, LeBron, the GM, he did it again. It's like what you mentioned football at the start of this, right? Have we ever seen what Antonio Brown just did? Have we ever seen that in any other sport where he just caused such a disturbance? <laughs> he supposedly had zero leverage at all. Same thing with, uh, if we if we think about it, same thing with um, Anthony Davis. Right. He's supposed to have no leverage at all. But basically, if you just cause enough of a shitstorm, you force the team's hand. It almost worked. It just the Pelicans were such a gong show, they didn't make it happen. But you're right, Webby, at the end of the day. It's ridiculous on some level. It's ridiculous for me to blame another team. Okay, that's right. Now, the last thing <laughs> I will I'll, give you that. The so last... I'll stick with Magic and and Palenka here. Okay. The last thing that Follow I'll mention. Follow me for a second here. Okay. Because they messed up by building the supporting cast around LeBron James. You have the best player in the in the world. And what we learned from last season is that LeBron had to play the full year just to get the the Cavs into what fourth place was it last year. They finished in fourth or fifth or whatever it was. I think they finished in fifth. But he had to play every single game with that crappy supporting cast last year. This year, the whole Lakers season went down the drain when LeBron James got hurt. And that's the part that, you know, we we all acknowledged at the start of the year. But then when it happened and then LeBron got hurt and the Lakers season fell apart, we blame LeBron still? I don't get that. Yeah, well, he's, he wasn't hurt for the whole year. Okay, but he, okay. so here's the thing. On Christmas Day, I found this stat. Shout out to ESPN for these stats, okay? So on Christmas Day, when the Lakers beat the Warriors, yeah, right? The Lakers had an 80% chance of making the playoffs. Then LeBron missed 17 games. The Lakers went 6-11. and 11. Over that same span... The Spurs, Houston, and Utah went a combined 36 and 17 hmm. to leapfrog the Lakers and start, you know, reestablish themselves in the playoff spot. But here's the thing as well. In the 24 games before LeBron got hurt, the Lakers were third in net rating. In the 17 games after, they fell to 22nd. And at the end of the year, it was going to be a, a dogfight anyways because they had the sixth hardest schedule over the last 30 games of the year including 19 of their last 30 games. We talked about this, right? Against teams above 500 right. and six games against the top four teams in the entire NBA. So this was all going to be difficult anyways. But when LeBron went down, it just showed that the supporting cast wasn't good enough. And not only were they not good enough, they all got hurt. Well, you know what makes it even more difficult, that tough schedule, is not having your best player and your franchise player now believe in the players that he's playing with. But thinking, isn't he that right? they're, thinking that they're expendable. No, because there was the same starting five that nothing changed when he came back from being injured. It Hold was on. still the same Brandon Ingram. To be honest, the, the biggest injury that affected the Lakers this season, I don't think was LeBron James. I think it's been Lonzo Ball. I agree with you, Webby. The next thing I was going to bring up is the games lost. And so Kuzma missed six games this year. Ingram missed 15 games. Lonzo missed 20 games. Rondo missed 34 games. Yeah. That's a combined 54 games from your point guards, Lonzo and Rondo. That means who's doing the bulk of the playmaking? Oh, LeBron James in year 16. And people are out here calling out his defense. <laughs> and my guy in year 16 is having to handle point guard duties wow. while... Averaging 27, 8, and 8, I I'm not, I can't no, no. blame LeBron. I just no. have a hard time blaming LeBron. And I understand all the sideshow things and trying to get Anthony Davis. But in that situation, 
we all would have done the same thing too. If we saw a path to getting Anthony Davis to our team, we all would have done the same thing too. But here's my thing. They were doing so well before he got hurt. It's not like they turned over the roster for when he got back. It was no, the same He got hurt Ingram. and saw that they're not good enough without him. But when they were with him, they were a playoff team. Uh, okay, but we're talking about making the playoffs. Now just if LeBron just makes the playoffs, like that's good enough? I think that LeBron saw that injury and saw what happened to that record and thought that, like, didn't believe in those teammates enough that they could make up that ground. No, I agree with that. <laughs> and so he tried to get Anthony Davis. Yeah. I'm not then, mad at that. But in doing that, he ruined that the kids that he was playing with. You're right. He ruined his chance of being the sixth seed in the Western Conference and losing in, what, the second round? Yeah, maybe. I but, know. I mean, it, it's probably a better better look if they do miss and then even get a shot at, you know, it looks like a pretty good draft this year. I mean, no, they'll have true. a good shot. But the, my, my big thing in this is, like, I, I take it back to the genie thing. You never trust a family where the mom <laughs> and dad – Name all their kids with the first letter, the same first letter. Like you're, what? especially if one of them's dumb, then it's like, cause, cause what was it? It was, uh, so it was Jeannie, Jesse and Jimmy bus, right? And Jimmy bus, I can't even remember. Jimmy bus was, was a dummy. It looks like <laughs> Jeannie bus isn't much better. And I'm sure Jesse bus is even worse than all three of them. What? Jeannie is a business person. She hired Magic and Rob Palenka. And how's, that, to... and, and how's that business doing right now? It's not booming. <laughs> no, business is not booming. <laughs> business is booming on the other side of town in your same arena. Right? And that brings us to the Clippers. How are they doing this right now? The Clippers are balling. I thought when they – I think everyone thought when they traded Tobias Harris, the thought was, oh, well – they're not really that focused on making the playoffs this year. They're kind of a, a feel-good story for early on in the year. But right now, they sit in seventh place. They've been playing really well as of late. Winners of, what, they're on a good run, seven of their last ten games. I mean, hey, shouts to the Clips, but how no. are they doing this? They're like the island of misfit toys. <laughs> it's like Danilo Gallinari and Trez Harrell and... All Montrez. these, yo, all these guys like Patrick Beverly, like yeah. all these guys who were cast offs from these other like very good teams, you know, huge that, shouts to our guy, Lou will as well. Yo, absolutely. Like it's a really good team. And you know what it is though, to be quite honest. And as much as like a lot of people are down on the guy sometimes and definitely with the GM coach role, it's very tough, but man, the doc rivers is earning his paycheck. Yeah, Doc is doing a job, and Doc has been one of those guys who people question, oh, does he only do it with star players? When, I mean, there's not really a star on this Who's team. Who's the star? He gets these guys to go hard. I saw Montrez Harrell today was on the herd with Colin Coward, and he was talking about how much Doc is just stays on them, right? Like, he doesn't let them let up. And I think when you are add that to the fact that, as you mentioned, you got a bunch of cast-offs, guys who have had to work their way into the NBA and then work their way into staying in the NBA. Hey, that's a massive, massive thing. But also you talked about what ownership did with the Lakers, what ownership did with the Clippers in terms of removing some of the responsibility from doc rivers and having him just focus on coaching. How much of a role do we think that's played in this as well? Well, here's the thing. It's because Steve Ballmer is now running this team like a business where the other owner, the other LA team is running the team like TMZ. <laughs> okay? It's not it, it's not a reality show, it's a business. Yeah. And I think nope. that Bomber figured that out pretty quickly because you remember when he first started out as the owner, he was uh as Suge Knight would say, all in the videos, <laughs> all in the hot tub, you know, like and, and it seemed like after the first couple of years, he figured out that you know what? Let me run this team like I run a business and not run it to get my face on the screens. And yeah. you're seeing now it's really paying off. You know, you delegate that responsibility of running the basketball operations. You know, you listen, you don't necessarily trust Doc Rivers it can do it all because he tells you he can. Also true. I mean, bringing in the logo, Jerry West has obviously added 
a lot of legitimacy to their front office. And Lawrence Frank has been said to be doing a really good job in the front office as well. And hey, being able to draft and get good value from your draft picks that might not necessarily be top five picks, but what they've done with Shea Gilgis Alexander, I mean, also add in uh, Montrez. Like, those are good picks. Those are good, solid picks. That It's not like a lot of people had those guys highly touted, but those are good finds, good players to be coupled with, you know, the quote-unquote cast-offs like the Lou Williams on your team, like well, the Gallinari. I think, wasn't Trez drafted by the Rockets? Uh, no, you're right. He was drafted yeah. in the second round by the Houston Rockets. But then how did he end up on the Clippers? Didn't he get traded? It had to be a trade, no? Uh, bu- 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 yeah, Shout you know. out to Google. Yeah, it was in the Patrick Beverly. It was in the Patrick Beverly. Oh, it was oh, in the, that. The other the one they got is, no? is Zubats. And this goes back to the Lakers. <laughs> But I guess this would be more to your point about building the right team. But Jesus Christ, you gave up Zubats for our boy and uh, friend of the show, um, Mike Muscala? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are the uh, Lakers? I think that's your boy, Mike Muscala. Certainly right? not my boy. <laughs> Get him out of here. But I mean, like, I, you just look at the way that those two teams in LA are run, and it's like. Uh, one is like I like that. One's being run like a business, the other's being run like a reality show. Yeah, I mean you're you're totally right in the sense that yes, uh Montrez Harrell, I know he wasn't drafted by them, but the fact that, you know, you able to hey, seek that asset, let's say, got in the front, Chris Paul deal. You've got front office people who see that asset as a valuable one, and that's important. Totally true. And hey, just look at the guys on this team and for him to have his own glow up, let's say, as I keep using that term for Pascal Siakam, but Montrez, he just keeps going and he kind of personifies what that team is. I remember bringing this up earlier, but I remember seeing an interview with Sam Cassell, who's an assistant there. And he said the reason why their team is so successful is because all those guys have to earn their minutes. There's not a star player on their team. So you have all these guys that have to earn their minutes. So when you get in the game, you have no choice but to go hard. You have no choice but to, you know, hedge on that screen or get on the offensive glass. Because if you don't do that, there's someone else who's fighting for their job, literally, but also fighting for minutes. But what a great story the Clippers have been. And you're right. It's the it's a complete opposite of the starry Hollywood Lakers. It's crazy. It's crazy to see what's going on in L.A. right now. But another team in the West I want to bring up for you, Webby, is the Houston Rockets. James Harden carried this team while Chris Paul was down, but the run that this that the Rockets have been on that is now seeing them get all the way up to third place in the Western Conference, something we couldn't have pictured, let's say, a couple months back. But I, was one, of, I was one of the people who said that they would miss the playoffs. Hey, I thought they would get back into the playoffs, but I didn't see this coming. Like I can't I could never have predicted this. Like that's crazy. Right? Their current streak, they've won 9 games in a yeah. row as of now as we mentioned they're playing the uh Golden State close Warriors game right, right now. now. Very close game. But the Rockets, Webby, as they've vaulted up to third right now, three and a half games back of the Warriors for first. Are the Rockets the second best team in the West? Like presently right now, maybe. I mean, it's still... No I, maybes here. Who are the Warriors playing in the conference finals? The Oklahoma City Thunder. Oh. They're, they're the most... They're, they're the team of the, those three in the Western Conference that are 2-3-4. Uh, Denver, Houston, and Oklahoma City. That's the yep. team, if I were the Warriors, that I would not want to see. Okay. I'm, so, I'm going with OKC as well. I just think that team is ready for the playoffs. Like... Like, they're built for the playoffs. And it's funny, We I went back because one of our early episodes when we were doing season previews, one of the things that we talked about was OKC was going to have a really good year because Paul George was just going to be more comfortable in his second year. Melo was out of the way. Yeah. And Melo being in the lineup mentally, like, you're thinking Melo is still Melo. So mentally, they're playing as if you're getting – whatever, 15 a night, 20 a night from Melo, and that's just not who he was, right? You're talking about minutes being given to him by the coach. You're talking about shots being taken, and now you remove all that. Then add in Russ, you know, I don't want to say allowing Paul George to cook, but Russ 
you know, allowing Paul George to cook. The, what <laughs> yeah. we've seen from Paul George this season, it's been absolutely incredible. And I think the pieces just fit into place. Russ is more comfortable with that sidekick. And that team, the role players, you know what you're getting from Adams, but the confidence that those other kids are getting in terms of Grant, in terms of, you know, like uh, Schroeder was a great pickup as well. Like, it's just such a good look, and that team is ready for the playoffs. No, you're absolutely right. Now, the other thing, too, is with Oklahoma City and Carmelo is that you replaced him uh, with an actual NBA player. (laughs) (laughs) All right? Somebody who can (laughs) play defense and shoot three-pointers. Because at that point, Uh, that's that's what you need. That's what Oklahoma City Thunder needs. That's That's what they've always needed is guys who can play defense and hit open three-pointers. And Carmelo wasn't going to do either of those things. Well, going back to the Lakers, here's a perfect example of basketball building. You need role players, people to, even if that's not their role, but accepting their roles. And, you know, compare the Lakers to what's going on in Boston and the troubles that they've been having. But at the end of the day, you know, Kuzma, Ingram, LeBron, those are all like offensive players. That's their main focus. And they're not there to do the dirty work. That's too many guys that are, you know, just worried about shots. Whereas OKC, well, you know, the shots are coming from Russ. The shots are coming from PG. And then you add in a guy to to fit that role even more in terms of just being a rugged, tough guy, Mark Markeith Morris, that's just adding someone else fitting into a role. And the, the pieces just fit better than when you look at teams and see why they're not successful. It's chemistry. It's because the pieces don't fit. I don't know. Also, too, we talked about Russ along the way this season, and I thought that his shooting numbers were terrible because I didn't think he was healthy, right? I felt like he was fighting through a lot of uh, just nagging injuries. more than healthy. Do you know what I mean, though? Like, he could play. Like, he was obviously still playing, but something was nagging him. Well, Royce Young today put this out. This was before their game on Wednesday, but he said Russ finally seems to be breaking out of his shooting struggles. Yeah. In his last 20 games, he's shooting 45.5% from the floor and then 34% from three. The last 10 games, 47% from the floor, 37% from three. So, hey, if that happens to Russ, yeah. that – just boost their hopes more in the playoffs. No? And this is what I was going to say, too, with the Rockets right now. That's why I was saying right now, yeah, they're probably the second-best team. But we've seen this before in the NBA as well. You don't want to peak at the wrong time. You don't want to have point. You don't want to have your 12, 13-game winning streak come, like we saying, a couple of weeks before the playoffs. What you want to do is kind of what Russ is looking like, and Paul George, too, coming back from the shoulder injury, is looking like what they're doing right now, which is getting their offensive games in sync and reliable. Because that way, when the chips are down in the in the, in the playoffs in the first, second round, th- I mean, we know that the Oklahoma City Thunder are going to rely on those two guys to provide them with the scoring that they need primarily. And if both of their shots are dropping, that's going to be a whole lot easier. Yes, totally. And fans of this podcast will know that I am definitely Team Russ. And I feel like most fans were Team Russ in a situation that happened earlier this week uh, as we switch gears to something a little more serious. But Russ versus the Utah Jazz fans this week. Right. And This week? Russ How about in- like this last like two years? Also true, because he's had multiple altercations with fans in Utah. Uh, if you remember back to the playoffs last year, there was a fan yelling in his face. Russ got mad. Then that was at halftime, I think. Then after the game, the fan had their phone right in his face, and he kind of slapped the guy's phone out of his hand. This has been an ongoing thing, but it kind of reached its boiling point earlier this week when Russ got into it, and there was video that surfaced first of Russell Westbrook yelling at a fan and at this point there was no context right we just see russ yelling threats at a fan saying i swear to god i'll f you up you and your wife no. i'll fuck you up I'll fuck you i don't up. know why one time i said f, f you up and then, and then the other time i said fuck <laughs> yeah. you up i'm not sure <laughs> but anyways you get the point so that video surfaced at first right then after the game there's an interview done by the local utah 
affiliate, and they interviewed this gentleman named Shane Keisel. Kessel? Keisel? I think we'll I'll go call Keisel. Him Keisel. Keisel, yeah. Keisel, sure. And this gentleman was interviewed after the game, and he said that Russ was yelling at him, but he was he said that <laughs> he told a local television station that he told classless Westbrook to, quote, sit down and ice your knees, bro. And then said that Russell needed to be exposed for threatening a woman. Right. So Russell Westbrook now, the, obviously the media goes to Russell Westbrook after the game. And Russell Westbrook said that the fan told him, quote, get dead on your knees like you're used to, which is a comment that Russ said he believes to be racial in nature and completely disrespectful. And Russ says that's what led to his out, his outburst against a fan. Then you had players come out saying that there were even worse things said, including Patrick Patterson tweeting out very soon after the game. You had uh, Raymond Felton tweeting out after the game. or no, yeah, Even other jazz players. Jazz players. There are a lot of people just verifying what, I guess, Russell Westbrook's side of the, of the altercation, right? You had teammates saying that. But then also the jazz at the end of the day who came out at the end and said, an investigation through video review and eyewitness accounts, they decided that the interaction, that Kiesel's interaction with Oklahoma City superstar merited a ban for, quote, excessive and derogatory verbal abuse directed at a player. And that violated the NBA code of conduct. There's a lot there, Webby. I don't even know where to start. But I guess the first question is, does the NBA have an issue with in terms of fan interactions with their players? Like, do they have to worry about player safety? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. I mean, I don't know if you saw the clip from soccer this past week, I think. But I you did just, see that. Yeah, you saw the guy run onto the field and punch that player in the face. Yep. That's going to happen in an NBA game. You know what? It's so funny that you said that. I was thinking about it, right? And we were having the conversation at work, and someone said, oh, well, the sports are just different, right? Like, soccer culture is just different than American culture. It's going to happen. North American culture, which I agree with. But the thing that made me think that you could be right in this situation, Webby, is the fact that North American culture, more than any, is doing it for the gram. And I feel like I was going to bring this up. Exactly. This goes you know, back to and, our and society. And that's the part thing. that worries me. There's yeah. someone out there that's just thinking, Hey, I can go viral if I do this. And you add in the layers to this because to shout out social media on another level, this could have been a, he said, she said situation. If it wasn't for the fact that social media went to this guy's Twitter account to expose like okay. a whole heap of racial or racist tweets, also du- like directed at everyone from the Obamas to Westbrook to Colin Kaepernick. He had a whole bunch of stuff. They found out that he's a mega Trump supporter as yeah. well. And Least social surprising media buried, news. Like, they unearthed all these things that caused my guy to start deleting tweets and then eventually deleted his entire account. But if that doesn't happen, we could be sitting here in some like he said, he said, she said situation, which is crazy. But further to your point, the doing it for the gram thing does kind of worry me in the situation because why had my guy even doing interviews after the game to begin with? Yeah, it, it's like that thing of like not releasing the name of of like high school shooters, things like that, because you don't want to give yeah. them the fame that's gonna show somebody else, you know, the next person who's gonna do something dumb like this and be like, oh, yeah, I can get my name on the TV. Yeah, uh, it's ridiculous. Now, I, I do think that the, I, I think that the fans are too close to the game uh, in every NBA arena. And what I think that they need to do is what you're seeing happen in college basketball uh, when they get to the tournaments is almost have a little moat around the, uh, around the course because otherwise you're, otherwise you're asking for it. I mean, that's interesting. It's interesting. I never even considered that before. You have fans on top of these players. My thing, too, was just the fact that I don't know if the NBA has a problem. I think Utah has a problem more so. And so Mm. if it's easier to more correct that, you might see some of the other things go away. I don't know, man. There's shitty people in every city in the States and uh, literally around the world, too. I don't know if it's necessarily... I agree with that. But 
did you even know about this like card system? Because essentially, if you're, or at least they have it in Utah, I guess they have it everywhere else, but I never heard of it until this Russell Westbrook thing. But if you're doing something at a game, security gives you a warning card oh, like before a yellow. they kick you out. Back to soccer. That's crazy. I didn't. I didn't even know about that. But obviously, Utah is a place where there's been articles written by local, like Utah papers, talking about the fact that their fans do go over the top and they're very excessive with the derogatory comments towards opposing teams' players. You've heard jazz players come out and say the exact same thing. If you remember back to the Derek Fisher situation, yeah, remember when Derek Fisher was right, on the Jazz, that was the Jazz. Yes, right? And he went back there during the playoffs and they were chanting, quote, cancer at him because he had to leave and go back to the Lakers because his uh, his daughter was like, sick. Eye cancer, yeah. Right? And so there's a history there in Utah. And so I don't want people to – I don't want the NBA to overreact and do something like super drastic just because this appears to be a Utah problem more than anything else. And I think Russell Westbrook is just the guy – that as much as people don't like him, and we learned that a lot of people don't like Russell Westbrook, I'll get to that in a second, but Russell Westbrook's the right person to turn this into this situation to where he's cussing the personnel on camera, didn't really care, whereas other players might have just taken it and worried about the camera filming them, swearing at this guy. Right. Also, too, one thing I want to say is, I feel like it goes without saying that obviously it's completely unacceptable for Russ to say that he would fuck up the guy's wife. Yeah. Right? Like I think that goes without saying we know that and just got to put that out there in case people are wondering, we didn't leave that out. Definitely think that that is something that is unacceptable. That should not be said. hundred percent. And the, like the other thing is too, man, this is another society thing that I was going to bring up with the gram. It's like, bro, you got yelled at what are you going to, go on TV and be like, he shouldn't have yelled at me. Like that's <laughs> well, exactly I, what you're doing to him. But also too, like, obviously my guy was straight up lying. As soon as you see the video and he's like, well, my wife was just sitting there with their hands in her lap and it was yeah, her right. first game ever. It's like, really? Like we know people might. And when I said that we found out that people dislike Russell Westbrook, I say that because when this story first came out, there were a lot of people quickly jumping to, oh, here goes Russ again. Russ is at it again. And then so I remember seeing this tweet and it made me laugh in the moment. Someone was like, if you really find yourself siding with this mega <laughs> yeah, literally a cop. Utah dot jazz fan, <laughs> I think you need to read that line over again and then reassess what's going on in this situation. Well, the other thing, too, it brings up your complete ignorance because you don't know anything about Russell Westbrook, who is like literally one of the most generous NBA superstars that's ever graced the hardwood. I mean, this is somebody who like gives back to the Oklahoma City indigenous community, mm -hmm. like the poor community, the educational uh, work, the education workers in Oklahoma City. Like he does so much for the community. Asks nothing back. He's never on TMZ with the mm -hmm. like like our boy Harden is at the white parties or anything like that. He's got a yeah. really like lovely wife and a great like family life. Uh, yeah, like literally a pillar of the community. He's only played in one place his entire career. It's not like he's one of these people who's demanding trades or anything. So yeah. these people who diss Russell Westbrook and say, oh, it's just Russ doing what he does. Like, you don't know anything about about the man, let alone the basketball player, you know? Yeah, and I, I know that I, I like Russell Westbrook. I'm obviously a Russell Westbrook supporter, but... My thing, I just found it so weird that people dislike Russell Westbrook that much that they didn't take a second to say, hold on a second, why would he, what would cause him to react like that? Right. right? Like the initial reaction was just, oh, Russ is freaking out yet again. And, you know, after you find out that the guy's probably hurling, like he's dealing with hearing racist shit and people are still saying, there, you have people out there that are thinking, hey, well, there's a line, but fans get to yell at you and you're a player and you have to deal with it. And I always come back to this point, like you don't get to tell someone else what they have to deal with. No, right? Like I could be offended by something that might not offend you, but I don't get to tell you, hey, you shouldn't be offended by that. Like that's not the way the world works. 
And then on the flip side of that, and I had to tweet this out because I was seeing a lot of just weird, weird takes the day after, but I had to tweet this out. And I said, here's a tip for the day. If you've never dealt with racism, you probably shouldn't be in such a rush to tell someone else how they should react to something that they deem is racist. A hundred and ten percent. It just baffled me. Yeah, yeah, that it, it's such a, um, you know, it's just a weird thing to me, right? Like I, in love, I, I love, I where... love the MAGA hat wearers going. Well, how can you t- say that's racist? Like, bro, you are like white privilege. You're literally <laughs> a highway patrolman in Utah. What can yeah. you tell somebody about what is racist and what's not racist? Also, too, uh, to as we finish up this story. My guy is trying to sue Russell Westbrook now. There's a story. He's not allowed to go to any more Utah Jazz games or any other events at the arena. Russell Westbrook was fined $25,000 for telling fans he'd fuck them up, which, okay, cool. But this guy plans to sue Russell Westbrook. It's like, really, dude? (laughs) Yeah. Um, But something you'll enjoy. So one of my group texts is with uh, our buddy LT and a couple people that I went to uh, Centennial with. Right. And we were talking about it and they were talking about Russ just in this context of, you know, yes, people are hurling, whatever, but you yelling at them back, like, what is that worth? Like, what do you get out of it? And the question at the end of our conversation, and this was like, and again, this conversation was going on while all the information was coming out. So it's not like they were defending the dude or dissing Russ. Do you know what right. I mean? We we're just having a conversation. Of course. But at the end, LT said, he said, so the guy's not allowed to the jazz anymore and russ is fine twenty five thousand dollars is that worth it to have you kind of look like you're making such a huge scene on camera and my response was what's 25 grand to a motherfucker like me can you please remind (laughs) me (laughs) right because it's just like yes that is worth it fuck that guy get the fuck out of here and hopefully you know i'm glad in this instance as much as we diss the internet and, you know, a lot of things are jokes on that we do on this podcast regarding the Internet. This was a good play by the Internet in which they got this guy the fuck out of here. And really, I, I it made me really think, Webby, what would have happened if the Internet culture of just getting like being like people being that quick to be like, oh, this there's this guy's name. Let's go find old tweets from this guy. What would have happened if that did not exist and we would have been sitting here being like well did russ did what did the guy say to russ i don't know what he said to russ do should we believe russell westbrook that worries me <laughs> i can't even lie that part worries me a lot i love like i i love the internet like goes and gets your receipts yeah like you could say you could do any interview you want to with root Northwest or whatever the Utah jazz is, you know what? We're going to find out the truth because you people are dumb enough to put this stuff on social media because it thinks you, you make it, you you think it makes you look cool. So, you know what? We're going to, we're going to call up those receipts and we're going to find what the real truth is. Well, you're playing to your audience, right? Of like-minded idiots. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. Right. And for the people who might be listening to this podcast, you might not be like, well into the internet culture of being on Twitter or Instagram or whatever to know what this guy was tweeting out. It takes a simple Google search, but let you know just like some of it was telling Russ to go back to wherever he came from. Like it was just like very like blatantly racist shit. So if you're telling of, me a lot of those dog whistle statements. Yeah, like if you're telling me that, you know, the probabilities or the likelihood of this guy telling Russ to get down on his knees or did he say you should ice up bro and again something we talk about on this podcast all the time the sarcastic bro <laughs> right like that's a huge level of disrespect yeah, yeah the sarcastic bro once the guy words. said he said he told him quote sit down and ice your knees bro once he added that bro I'm like this guy's lying a eh? and either way it was mad disrespect what he was trying to say maybe that's what Marquis Chris said to Ibaka? Do you think he gave him the disrespectful bro? Maybe. maybe. Now, the the other thing is, too, you brought up the the yellow card, red card system Mm -hmm. at the Utah games. They obviously don't have that at Knicks games. That or Dolan gave the guy the straight red when he said sell the team. Yo, James Dolan, like, doesn't deserve 
much time in terms of anyone's conversations. But my thing here, Webby, is imagine being so stanky rich, right? That you could have an asset that people want to buy for five billy <laughs> and they all hate you. And if you sold the team, <laughs> everyone would be so happy with you. But people hate you for not selling something that's worth five billion dollars. So, and you're just like, nah, man, I'll take the hate. What? I, so I, I think I think it's Adam Carolla. I gotta attribute this right. And he says, you know, yeah, sure, there's fuck you money out there. Mm -hmm. But what Dolan has is fuck me money. <laughs> like you can be that dumb and you can have all those people hate you and still say, you know what? Fuck it. That's that <laughs> fuck me money that Dolan has. It's crazy. Oh man. Speaking of people saying fuck you or fuck me buddy or fuck whoever <laughs> steve kerr your man's oh. steve kerr webby caught oh, on camera your boy uh, coach of the year coach of the year steve kerr caught on camera apparently saying the lip readers are out in these streets <laughs> apparently <laughs> thinking that he said i'm so fucking tired of draymond shit yeah Close I, quote. I watched it that's what he said <laughs> Why? Well, they what, both had to actually do a presser to talk said. about it. Of course they did. <laughs> and, I mean, I didn't even care what Steve Kerr said. I just wanted to see Draymond's face when he was asked about it. And he had this, like, shit-eating grin on his face. And he just kind of said, oh, well, you know, shit happens. <laughs> what? Uh, d do you think this has any impact on the Warrior season? Or is there anything to worry about with this Warrior season as you're seeing that Hey, they appear to be getting tired of Draymond's act. No, is that the, anything to worry about? No, this the, the the Warriors don't have anything to worry about until the playoffs really get going, and about the second or third round. So, do you think that? Because everyone's just saying, "Hey, as long as this team's together, no problems. It's a championship guaranteed." Do you buy into that or no? No, I don't think it's a champion. I don't think it's championship guaranteed. I think we've really seen. Uh, Boogie fall off a cliff over the last couple of weeks and still wondering, you know, who the other two guys off their bench are who are going to be in the, in the playoffs. Like sure. Maybe Iggy's one, but they lost a lot. And it's weird to think like losing guys like Nick young and stuff would be that big of a, a, a blow to this team. But I just don't think they're as deep as they were when they were, when they were winning, uh, when they were waltzing their way to championships and NBA finals. Now, I could be wrong. I could be, could be completely wrong. Yeah. But uh, I think it's going to be a little harder road uh, to get this fifth, would it be fifth championship in six years? No, 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 no. They've only won three. So four and five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, four and um, here, Here's my thing, though. I think, I think the biggest problem with them is teams don't fear them anymore. Like, Houston thinks they can beat them because they were so close last year. We yeah. definitely know Russ thinks he can beat them, yeah. regardless of whether it's true or not, right? And I think those teams in the East, your Boston, the Raptors, the Bucks. I don't think that – I hold know on, your Sixers as well. Yeah, your Sixers as well. Hold on. <laughs> They're third in the I East right now. I did not do that on purpose either. My bad. But I don't think any of those teams fear which I feel like – in past years, teams feared the Golden State Warriors. That's not a thing anymore. And I think that will be their biggest issue going through the playoffs because it's not just last year where we thought, oh, well, Houston's the only team that has a shot against them. This year, we think, okay, Houston has a shot. OKC has a shot. If you listen to Chuck and Kenny, they obviously think the Blazers have a shot. Mm. Then add in those teams in the East. But, hey, they got to figure something. Out. Or, it leads to my next question, is this current core of the Warriors, are they done as a group? Oh, after this year? Yeah. Well, yeah, because Durant's leaving. <laughs> I'm with you. But, I'm I with mean, you. Even if, Durant's out. Even if Durant's you take out. Durant out of, that, out of that equation, do you think that Draymond signing with Clutch is, a, is more of a sign that he's going to leave or more of a sign that he's going to stay? I think it's more of a sign that he's trying to get money. Yeah, and but, Clutch is telling them, "We'll get you your money." Uh, you think he's? That's gonna, what I think. You think he's gonna? You didn't answer my question. 
Is he going to get that money with Golden State, or is he going to get that money elsewhere? I don't know, because here here's the problem with Golden State. Golden State, if they max out Clay, right, KD's gone. They're going to try to do everything to, to – do you know what, actually? I think it's going to be elsewhere, because no matter how this plays out, I think they're leaving. But they're going to try so hard to keep KD, they're going to throw Draymond under the bus. And he's not going to like that part of it. No. Because he, right? I don't think he's going to like that part of it. They're going to say, hey. Uh, unless they win again. I still don't think it matters. I still don't think it matters. If they win again and KD leaves, Draymond's going to want the max. And I still don't really argue with him. He's been a very, very, very important part to their team. Now, was it smart to give him the max? No. No. But I understand no, why like, he would want the max. It's like giving, uh, what is it? It's like giving Dak Prescott all that money that I'm hoping the Cowboys are going to do. Your NFC East bias isn't I know. showing at all. I know. <laughs> I know. So good. So good. So much going on in the NBA this week. And it was good to get into, you know, all of those big topics. So much going on. We got of a course. stretch run here. We're almost at the playoffs. We're like two, three weeks away. We are so close, and it's been such a great season. And the playoffs, as we just discussed, it's going to be so much fun because there's so much yet to be determined. As we mentioned, yeah, there's so four teams that we could see winning the East and at least two or three we could see winning the West. Like, that's going to be a lot of fun. I just think playoffs that the, are West, be amazing. the Western Conference first round, if it were to be the way it is right now, would be mm -hmm. incredible. And then yeah. if the East holds and all of your – you know, um, higher seeds, I guess, if Boston beats Indiana right now, they wouldn't be the higher seed. But if those four teams advance in Milwaukee, Toronto, Philly, and Boston, that's a mm -hmm. that's an insane second round. Oh, can't that's, wait. That's It'll must so see good. TV, no matter how it shakes out. It'll be so good. Also, I just want to point this out to the fans. There could be some stuff in the works. If there's something, if podcasts or something that you guys would be interested in, like at a venue or something, let us know what you think. There's stuff in the works. So if that's something you guys want to see, tweet at us. Let us know. It'd be something that you guys would get behind. Cause Very cool. I'll just say there's like light talks going on right oh, now. Okay. I'll say that. I'll say that. <laughs> but let's close out the podcast as we normally do, Webby, where we do a little Ask On Blast. We talk a little bit of pop culture, and we just kind of ask if you've been watching certain stuff or listening certain to certain things this week. And the one thing I'm going to ask you, we talked about a and R LeBron. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the project was two changes album. Have you listened to two changes album yet? When no, I, I haven't. And so I'm going on Spotify right now. Is it on okay. Spotify? Should be. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait. Or is Me? it? No, it's I not. I don't think it was an Apple exclusive. It might've been, it might've started on Apple, uh, but it's got to be on Spotify by now. Two chains. Rapper, go, rapper to the go to the league. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm on I'm on the train tomorrow. I'm feel I'm feeling so behind on the time series. It's old man Webby here. But I'm just looking <laughs> I'm just looking at the features on this and already I'm liking what I'm seeing. Got Thugger, I got mm -hmm. Lamar, I got uh Chance, uh Monday. Uh, listen, hey, thank, <laughs> thank you next. Listen, if you don't think thank you next is a jam, then we, we, we got, we, we're going to have words because it's a jam. And it's I don't so know weird. what that song is. It's so weird because I love I really don't know what song that is. What, Thank You Next? Yeah, I don't know oh, what song bro, that is. Oh, bro, come on. Get on your pop music, man. It's good. <laughs> it's good. I'm slacking. I need my much video on demand. Is that what the show is called? That's right. Yeah. It's it's on well, I, I grew up in the States. It was TRL. TRL. With 106 Carson, in Park. With, oh, yeah, well, come on. With uh, Free and... Uh, AJ. And who's the guy that looked like a horse? Oh, wow. Jeez. My guy with the dreads there. I forget what his I'm name I'm just going to let that one go. What was his <laughs> Although, name? Although, I was going to say... You know who I'm talking off about. that to our next topic, but our next our next topic doesn't get any easier. I was going to ask <laughs> you if you took in the MJ doc. Oh, man. You know, I tried not to. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Because no, no, no. the last thing I want to do is sit around for four hours and have these guys graphically tell me the sexual abuse they suffered at the hands of Michael Jackson. But as the loyal listeners to Ball on Blast will surely notice last week, we did not have a show. 
and that's because I was in the throes of sickness. I was KO'd, off work, lying on the couch. And when you're lying on the couch, full of cold medication, you're just looking for things to watch. So I turned on the MJ documentary, and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. It was harrowing. Yeah. It was ridiculous, man. Like... It was really I, fucked up. And, and I, understand, I understand getting those stories out there, and it's going to help with other victims and stuff, but I don't know why I subjected myself to that. No, I, I totally understand to hear you, Webby, because I, I feel the same way, and I always try to give that, you know, that preface to people when when talking about it if they haven't seen it. Like, make sure it's something that you're prepared to watch because it's tough. It's It's a tough watch, but... As, you know, people that we enjoy documentaries, we enjoy, we worked in the TV business, obviously. One of the things that I was more focused on in this was the fact that it kind of scared me that a documentary like that could be put out that was just from the one side. And I know yeah. what they were trying to do in terms of telling the story of how the abuse affected the lives of these people. And I get that and I understand that. But I was wondering about the journalistic responsibility and believe me when I tell you this, I am not defending Michael Jackson. I think there's definite, very, very, very fucked up things that happened in spite of whatever those guys said, right? Like, there's a lot of looking at it like, yo, bro, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah. So I'm not defending Michael Jackson here. I'm talking about in terms of doing a documentary and, like, the journalistic responsibilities of telling a story but and here... just not having the other side told at all. But here's the right? thing. You're confusing journalism with documentary filmmaking. Also true. Those are You're two totally different right. things. Two totally different right. things. Like Michael Moore is one of the best documentarians that America has ever produced. And I love his documentaries, but I'll be the first one to say is that you're not getting both sides of those stories. Nope. You're totally right. You're totally right, Webby. And that's why we work as a team. That's right? it. That's <laughs> totally it. makes sense. Now, did you uh, stick around for the Oprah interviews afterwards? I started watching it, but I didn't get through the whole thing. Yeah, I kind of had it on, and then I was like, I, I just, I need a little bit of break from all this yeah. talk. Yeah, and the thing, too, was I watched it late. I watched it late at night, yeah. and I was like, I need to watch something else <laughs> yeah. so that that's not the last thing I watch before I go to bed. That's right. Yeah, that, that's why the challenge is around, right? <laughs> yes. That's why the challenge is around. That's why I got a bunch of TMZs just stockpiled on my PBR. You know, some very Cavallari came back this oh, week. Oh, yo, your boy Jay Cutler back in your life. Oh, Jay Cutler back in my life. I didn't realize how much I missed Jay Cutler, but yo, I that heard show's his, so good. I heard his name being uh, thrown around for the Monday Night Job. Whoa! Yeah. Hey, I'd be, I'd, I'd support that. I'd, I'd support be that. in. I'd be in on that, man. I really would. I have not done such a 180 on somebody after they retired. Me neither. That I have on Jay Cutler. So Me good. neither. <laughs> I, and I've only seen like bits and pieces of that show. It's like, you know, one of the wife shows. But yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. I, but I knew Cutler was on it. And I had to kind of explain to Ashley I, like who Jay Cutler was and like why it's so funny that he's such a surly <laughs> D-back on this show and why it's hilarious. <laughs> Yes. Uh, um, but but again, like no, like you say, it's a 180. I think he's the man now. Oh, it's so funny. And for people who might be listening to this and they're like, what do you mean you watch Very Cavallari and have TMZ on the PVR? A little background here. I <laughs> do a lot of editing and stuff late at night. And what ends up happening is while the bars are going by and I'm waiting for things to upload and all those fun things, I need background TV watching. And oh. shouts to my guy David Jacoby at the, at ESPN, formerly of Grantland and the the Right Reasons podcast. But their reality show podcast they used to have, they had this thing called TSOP, meaning <laughs> time spent on phone. Yeah, no, so that's, a lot. Of, so that's it's a, such great, a point. great metric. But <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because all these shows that I watch. I'm not fully watching them. No. You, you, they're on in the background. Your head's up. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, cool. Here's Jay Cutler chasing around a llama in his backyard. <laughs> What's happening right now? So, and yo. I enjoy that. And there's no shame in my game, for the record. 
And Not that a... was that was the big thing about that Michael Jackson documentary too. It got to like hour three. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm on Twitter. I'm searching yeah. NBA Reddit and stuff. Yeah. Like the TSOP is a real thing. TSOP, big thing, big thing. Um, one last thing I want to ask you about Webby is I'll save the serial podcast stuff on HBO. Did you did you ever did you listen to serial podcast? Of course, yeah, I loved it. It's so did you watch the incredible. HBO doc? I'm did just like this? so. I'm like halfway into the first episode. Is there only okay. the one episode out now? I think so. Yeah, I think it's going to air every Sunday. I think there might be three or four weeks in a row that it'll air. So we'll talk about that okay. for sure. But if you're someone listening to this and you listen to the Serial Podcast, know that we'll talk about that in the coming weeks. But one thing I do want to ask you about is the show Shameless. Okay. Do you watch so, Shameless? So again, this is a wife show. Oh, okay, okay. And I've Shameless kind... just wrapped up. Well, so it wrapped up this season, right? And it's... It's going to keep going, but she's done. Yes. Spoiler alert. Yes. I'm sorry. Hey, come on, guys. <laughs> I'm joking. Guys, the internet's it, around right now. Get it together. And the internet's there. I think people have known that Fiona or Emmy Rossum yeah, is going to leave the show after this season. I think people knew that already, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, season nine just wrapped up. And there's a great article on The Ringer that just details the fact, and I thought it was such a good point, of how has Shameless been able to last so long yeah. when – how it hasn't gotten canceled or, quote, hashtag canceled. Meaning, with all the shit going on in pop culture and people getting canceled for going too far, meaning can canceled from culture, how has this show, which is a habitual line stepper, yeah, right, see, managed to survive in this era? I don't know, man. I don't find it that, like, I mean, some of the shit is kind of crazy. Hold on. Some of the shit. There's, like, full-on storylines that have to do with, like, the toddler finding coke on the table and sniffing it by accident and then feeling to go to jail for it. Like, yeah. there's, like, serious, serious shit Listen, going on. Man, Racist there, shit where they get, like, the KKK to basically – Frank gets a KKK to – to basically stand outside the voting booth to stop any of the I did black see that. or yeah. homosexual <laughs> voters from going in to vote. And then it leads into this huge brawl. And the person that Frank is trying to get elected is like a pedophile. Like the storylines on this show are crazy. But and bro, somehow the show's been able to survive. It's nothing different than Oz. Oz is still the craziest show that I've ever seen like that. Nothing's going to top it. And it it's was more really... the dramedy. This is more the comedy. Yeah. For sure. But I know what you're saying, though. I know what you're saying. Now, the... that's a good callback, Webby. Yo, know, because that was like the first one of those hour long HBO shows where anything goes. And it was so crazy and so much wild stuff happened yeah. that, like, if Oz, Oz would not be, even on HBO, would not be able to, like, exist today. No, I totally agree with you. But so much, so much going on TV land as always. Yo, the, hold on. One more thing about uh, about uh, Shameless. Okay. Is this show now needs to be, instead of the family, uh, make it about who's my guy with the shaved head with the black wife and the two daughters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> why, I've been drawing a blank right Yo, now. Yo, every. But yeah, yeah, yeah. V. E v, yeah. Yo, uh, every show, they're the funniest parts. Oh, I do Veronica and Kevin. Veronica they are and incredible. Kevin. That yeah. is true. They definitely could have their own spinoff. And people kind of wondering, you know, uh, could the show survive without Fiona? And the thing is, Frank is like an all time, like just crazy character. William H. Macy yeah. is such an done such an amazing job playing that character, so that could last forever. Lip is such a good character. That that storyline could last forever, and yeah, it's and the, like the brother, the the gay one who's in jail, yeah, like they're all really good characters for sure, and they all have such crazy storylines each and every season. That even if you remove Fiona, there's still like eight other things you could follow that would make for a good television show. Yeah, and to be honest, just based on my very limited watch of this show, mm -hmm. Fiona was getting a little annoying. Agreed. I totally agree. I agree. <laughs> yes. It's like I I I, I want to spend more time with with V and Kevin. Like I want to <laughs> spend more time just at the bar. Would you go to that bar? You'd 100%. definitely check out that bar, right? 100%. Of course. Absolutely. 
I've I've drank in way worse bars. <laughs> Fair enough. I think that seems like a very good place for us. Probably, to wrap probably. Up. That's great. <laughs> That's so good. Oh man, no, but totally, Webby. I totally agree with you. I think that show is great. I'm glad that it's going to continue. And of course, as always, on our Ask on Blast segment, send us in any thing that you want us to review any new shows any albums that are out there as we discuss that at the end of every podcast but of course we're here for basketball as well so send all your basketball takes to us wherever you're listening to this podcast or social media accounts web where can the people find you to hit you up with their hot takes yo hit me up anytime man i'm watching the sixers raptors any big game that's on TV, the Sunday night, the Sunday afternoons, the Saturday night games. If you have any thoughts at all about what's going on in the NBA, hit me up on Instagram and Twitter. It's the same on both at a Webster eighty four. Totally, and you can do the same with me on Twitter at Shell Alexander or on Instagram at Sheldon Alexander. And those two places are the is where you can find our wrap it up podcast which is our Toronto Raptors game show live on Twitter after each and every Toronto Raptors game and then also becomes a podcast same place that you can find this podcast so if you're listening to this podcast wherever you found this just like and subscribe and you'll get the Raps post game show to go alongside with this our NBA wide top the ball on blast podcast so shouts to our listeners and you know what? I'm going to do it right now because I always forget to do this. But I like going to shout out the different where people are listening to us. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Shout out to people on SoundCloud. Those are the OGs that have been riding Day with one. us the ball on Day Blast one. Podcast. Since when, Webby? Day one. Day one for sure. So shout out to the people that are on iTunes, that are on Google Play. But a big shout out to the people that are on SoundCloud. Really appreciate you guys. We got people listening in Scarborough, in Milton, in Calgary, Vancouver, Surrey. Like, shout out to all you guys. Slurry. Surrey, yes. I love it out there in Slurry. (laughs) Shout out to everyone that is on the wave of the On Blast podcast. We really appreciate you guys. You guys are the reason why we do this and why this podcast continues. And a huge shout out to the people that will be listening on YouTube as well. The YouTube conversations are always so much fun. For the chat and YouTube, so funny. The comment section there, really appreciate it. Of course, the reason why we appreciate it is because I really did used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this. This is the Ball on Blast podcast, as always, unpolished and unapologetic. Until next time, see ya. Hey. This is Ball on Blast. Part of the On Blast Podcast Network, available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you like it, then subscribe and tell your friends. Holla. On blast.